Christian greetings to all our valued listeners and viewers throughout the whole world. More particularly to all Shepherds Rod believers and most especially to our beloved brothers and sisters in the United States of America. Special greetings to our brethren in Colorado, in Georgia, in Fiji Island, in Mexico, Spain, in Africa, to the United Kingdom, and to our brethren in Australia, and to the rest of the 144,000 living saints scattered abroad. Greetings. May the good Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. This is our episode number 8 on the subject, the 42 months prophecy. And of course, that subject is the particular object in view. On Revelation chapter 10, the last um, or the first two verses in Revelation 11 verse 1 and 2 is a part of the subject or included in the subject on Revelation chapter 10. Now let us enumerate one by one those things that we already taken. Uh, first of all, in track number 5, page 100, saying events to take place just before the seven trumpet sounds, and that is the events on Revelation chapter chapter 10. And concerning Revelation chapter 10, according to track number 6, page 65, there are two movements. It says, the revelator also having been given a vision of these two movements recorded in chapters 10 and 11. But let us distinctly separate the two movements prior to the bestowal of the shepherd's rod message and the two movements in the period of the shepherd's rod message or the groundwork and the particular object in view. We already explained that in the groundwork, the angel in Revelation chapter 10 is directly applied to William Miller in the groundwork. He is the angel who ate the little book, which is the book of Daniel, sweet as honey in his mouth, but became bitter in his belly, pointing to the great disappointment. And the illustration in the Bible, according to 2 TG 15 page 4, saying, You know that man naturally starts out with his right foot. Now since the angel's right foot was upon the sea, and his left foot upon the land, or the earth, the symbolism shows that he starts out on the sea, the province of Daniel's beast, Daniel chapter 7. Then on earth, the province of the two-horned beast, Revelation 13 verse 10 to 18. Although the explanation is indicating worldwide, but the perfect fulfillment of the prophecy can be easily understood that since the legs represents the gospel, according to 2 TG number 8, page 20, saying, Indeed so, for the legs of the gospel are the legs of the people who proclaim it. 2 TG number 8, page 20, plainly indicating that the angel on Revelation chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, is divided into two sections, the groundwork and the particular object in view, by which the particular object in view, of course, cannot be applied to William Miller, because according to 2 TG number 15, page 3, this angel has all the characteristics of a power that sends down the latter rain, and that causes the spiritual grain fully to develop. For that is what clouds, sunshine, and rainbow indicate. As a rainbow never appears without rain, the angel is therefore the angel that brings the rain and the sunshine for the development of the final harvest. To each big country, and we know that the latter rain is the shepherd's rod. Message. Here in one page in Old Symbolic Code, uh, number 5, page 5, saying, Whereas to us at the present time, the former rain is the spear prophecy, and the latter rain, the shepherd's rod. One Symbolic Code, number 5, page 5. Whereas to us at the present time, former rain is the spear prophecy, and the latter rain is the shepherd's rod. Both the former rain and latter rain were not as yet in existence in the days of William Miller. Therefore, William Miller is only the groundwork, not the particular object in view. And we can easily understand that in the groundwork, the, the focal point of his message is directed to the sea. And it is even more 
directly pointing to the four great denominations. The message of William Miller is addressed to the Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists, those churches that had been raised by God during the Dark Ages. But the particular object in view, the messenger in Revelation chapter 10, his message is directed to the earth, the symbolical earth, the to whom beast domain, and is perfectly corroborating to the pronouncement and the message, Revelation 8 and verse, uh, verse 13, which we explain several times that according to track number 5, page 26, and track number 5, page 41, that the subject of the trumpet study is a symbolical prophecy, and every term must be symbolical accordingly. Therefore, Revelation 8, verse 13, being a part of the subject of the seven trumpets, then the earth mentioned here must be symbolical. So let us read again in Revelation 8, verse 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woo, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Now, of course, the description flying in the midst of heaven the same description in Revelation 14, verse 6 to 12. We fully believe that since the book of Revelation is to be more directly applied in the judgment that pertains to the living, so the significance of flying through the midst of heaven is broadcasting the message through the air, through internet. And the same with the statement in TG number 13, page 9, saying, the term trumpet is significant of broadcasting a message to TG 13, page, page 9. So, to repeat again, the message is directly addressed to the inhabitants of the earth, the symbolical earth. And we already read in to TG number uh, 14, page 15, the chapters 10 and 11, consequently sandwich in chapter 8 and 9, to TG 14, 15. So our subject, Revelation chapter 10, is sandwich on Revelation 8, 13 and Revelation 9, verse 1. So we can easily understand that the particular object in view in Revelation chapter 10 must find its fulfillment after the pronouncement of the message in Revelation 8.13 and before the fulfillment of Revelation 9 verse 1. Revelation 9 verse 1 in its direct application or the particular object in view that is pointing to Christ's visitation on the earth and that is the visitation of Christ in Luke 19 when he will come to slay his enemies. And that is why here in track number 5 on page 72 it says, uh, track number 5, page 72, To those, therefore, who accept Christ as their king, he is a savior, while to those who refuse to have him rule over them, Luke 19.14, you see Luke 19.14, that is, to the ten servants by which they refuse to submit themselves to the one whom God appointed to reign in his stead. And we know that in Luke 19, verse 27, God called them as his enemies. So, to them that refuse that Jesus Christ would... So, to those who, who will refuse that Jesus Christ would reign over them through someone else, when Jesus Christ will come, he is a destroyer. But to those who submitted themselves, Jesus Christ is a savior. And... That is perfectly corroborating to the statement on 1SR 151 saying, While God will come with vengeance to some, 1SR uh, 151, While God will come with vengeance to some, He comes with salvation to others. Isaiah 59 verse 20, And the Redeemer shall come to Zion. This is not referring to the second coming of Christ in the clouds. For it takes place before probation closes. He's not coming with vengeance to the ungodly in the world, but coming to the church. And when he comes, he will do the work mentioned in Malachi 3, verses 1 to 3. So let us go back to track number 5, page 
uh, 72. It says, To those therefore who accept Christ as their king, he is a savior. While to those who refuse to have him rule over them, Luke 19.14, he is a destroyer. Hence, accordingly, the curses or judgments fall as the trumpets reveal upon those who reject the teachings and the authority of the Bible and who as a, who, as a result do not have the seal. These solemn facts gravely admonish us not to forget the Bible's warning that our treatment of it will bring one of two results, death or life. At track number 5, page 72. So here the shepherds had made it so plain that the whatever that curses uh, or judgments will be inflicted unto them who reject the message as the trumpets reveals, meaning pointing to the complete unfoldment of the subject concerning the trumpets and more particularly to the last three wood trumpets. But uh, this time, we focus our attention to Revelation chapter 10. One of the messages that if you will reject this message, then you will not be surprised if uh, you will suffer the consequence of such rejecting uh, the message. Now, so Revelation chapter 10 uh, verses 1 to 11, including verse 1 and 2 of Revelation chapter 11. The the complete unfoldment must be in the period of the judgment that pertains to the living. That before uh, the unfoldment of that message, there must be a divine warning first so that all who wish to escape the oncoming destruction, they will not put themselves in a wrong side, rejecting the message and hindering the message. And of course, there is only one way to escape such destruction, is to accept the message and leave the message. And as a result, we will be sealed by the seal of the living God. Now, we already explained that... um, According to track number 5 on page uh, 79, saying, With the 14th verse of Revelation chapter 9 begins the description of the sixth trumpet, and it ends with the 14th verse of Revelation chapter 11, which announces the second woe, sixth trumpet is passed, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Accordingly, each prophetic event recorded between Revelation 9.14 and 11.14 must find its fulfillment in the period of the sixth trumpet between the first and the second woes. So, uh, there, there is a bracket period given according to track number 5, page 79. Revelation 9.14 and Revelation 11.14 that each prophetic event must find its fulfillment between the first and second woe. But let us focus first to our attention to the sounding of the sixth trumpet. Uh, we already uh, studied several times that in Revelation 9 verse 13 and 14, the voice cometh from the golden altar. And to repeat again, that is the voice of Jesus Christ. In the mere fact that the voice coming in the golden altar indicate that Christ's mediatorial work is in the holy place. So let us read again, track number 5. Page 78. In coming from the golden altar, the command, Loose the four angels, shows that the sixth trumpet sounded sometime before the veil to the most holy apartment of the heavenly sanctuary was lifted. Otherwise, the voice would have come from the throne, the most holy place. Track number 5, page 78. So, and the, the shepherds declared clearly, Track number 5, page 100, that the events to take place before the seventh angel begins to sound is Revelation chapter 10. But since we have already the groundwork and we read several times in consecrated way to Christian perfection, that in its primary phase, the seventh angel begins to sound when Jesus Christ entered to the most holy place. So I would like to read again, Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection, page 111 and 112. After the 490 years of the limitation upon the Jews in Jerusalem, there yet remained 1,810 years to the Gentiles. This period beginning, as we have found in the fall of AD 34, 
preaches inevitably to the fall of AD 1844 and marks that date as the expiration of the 2,300 years. And at that time, upon the word of the wonderful number in Daniel 8 verse 14, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. In 1844 also was the very time of the day of the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound, and when the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. At that time there will be broken up the horror of great darkness by which the mystery of iniquity had hid from ages and generations the mystery of God. At that time the sanctuary and the true tabernacle and the truth of it would be lifted up from the ground where the man of sin had cast them down and stamped upon them, and will be exalted to the heaven where they belong, and whence they will shine forth in such light as that. The earth shall be lightened with the glory. At that time, the transcendent truth of the priesthood and minister of Christ would be rescued from the oblivion to which the abomination and transgression of desolation had consigned it, and would once more and forever stand in its true and heavenly place in the faith of the church accomplishing in every true believer that perfection which is the eternal purpose of God which is the purpose in Christ Jesus our Lord. Consecrated way in question perfection 111 and 112. And here... Uh, we can easily discern that in such subject it is closely connected the subject of the exceeding great horn. Why? According to that reading in consecrated way the question of perfection 111-112. But even in Revelation chapter 10, the focal point on Revelation chapter 10 is the book of Daniel. Because that little book, we know that that is the book of Daniel. And the focal point of the book of Daniel is the cleansing of the sanctuary and how the exceeding great horn trodden underfoot the daily in the sanctuary. So the particular object in view on Revelation chapter 10 is concerning the book of Daniel when it will be completely understood, when it will be completely unfolded. And we know that the particular object in view in the book of Daniel, according to the voice of inspiration by which Daniel do not understand, it is concerning the exceeding great horn. Track number 3, page 34. The work of the exceeding great horn was therefore what he did not understand. So, it is the work of the exceeding great horn by which Daniel did not understand. And we know, uh, brethren, that the explanation of the exceeding great horn is found on chapters 11 and 12. On page 35, on track number 3, it says that chapters 11 and 12 contain the explanation of the vision promised by, angel, by the angel in chapter 10 can be readily recognized not only from the continuity of the angel speech but also from the fact that those chapters are the explanation of the vision in the 8th chapter, track number 3, page 35. So, concerning chapter 8 from Daniel, the particular object in view is concerning how the exceeding great horn trodden underfoot, the daily and the sanctuary, and also how the sanctuary is cleansed. Now, since um, we already uh, studied different subject and concerning the exceeding great horn, according to 2 S R 139, saying the horn will over all the earth. And in that reading, the shepherds were declared clearly that the Bible is very plain that in Daniel 2 verse 39, it is during the brass kingdom by which the horn shall be rules over all the earth. But the fact is that it cannot be applied to Grecia, neither applied to pagan and papal Rome. Because if that is the case, then God would not say it that it is the brass kingdom. But according to track number 2, page 13, brass has a numerical value of number 3. So what inspiration is trying to to emphasize that it is on the third period of the exceeding great horn that such horn power shall be ruled over all the earth. And since according to track number 3, page uh, 39, the, the exceeding great horn are divided into three divisions, pagan Rome, papal Rome, and the Protestant period. 
And we know that the Protestant period is the period after the Dark Ages. Uh, the same with the statement in 2 TJ 22, 21, and 22. The Protestant period is the time of the White Horse in Zechariah chapter 6. And that is the period after the Dark Ages. Now, it is also perfectly corroborating to the subject of the Temple's type. Because the, the shepherds had plainly told us in 2SR 271 that if there are two literal typical temples that were destroyed, there must also be two antitypical spiritual temples that will be destroyed. But the first antitypical spiritual temple that had been destroyed, that is the Ephesus, uh, the first candlestick in Revelation chapter 2, and the second section of the early Christian church, because the early Christian church is divided into two sections. The first section is the apostolic church, the second candlestick in Revelation 11, verse 3 and 4, and the second section of the early Christian church is the Ephesus, um, the first candlestick in uh, Revelation chapter 2, and it is the Ephesus that had been destroyed during uh, the Dark Ages or in 538 AD. And it is no longer, uh, the destruction is no longer literal but spiritual. So here in one symbolic code, number 3, page 5, saying, Notwithstanding the example which God made of the Jewish leaders, the successors to the apostles as the successors to Moses, by adopting worldly customs and rejecting Luther's message, they also betrayed their sacred trust. Hence, the case of the kingdom of heaven were taken away from the early Christian church, which says, it says Catholic later. One symbolic code number three, page five. What happened to the early Christian church, the Ephesus? It became Catholics. And for sure, if we will trace the historical event, that Ephesus, which had been conquered by Catholics at this present time, they must be the evangelical church. Now, concerning the second antitypical spiritual temple, it is also composed with two candlesticks. The golden candlestick in Revelation chapter 3, which is the Laodicean, and the golden candlestick in Zechariah chapter 4. But for sure, it is the first section of the latter-day Christian, the first section that will be destroyed. It is opposite to the first antitypical spiritual temple because it is the second section that had been destroyed. And the same uh, history uh, repeats of itself that this first section uh, the, uh, the typical spiritual temple, which is the Seventh day Adventist Church, because uh, Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, Baptists, and the First day Adventists never been called as uh, sanctuary or temple. So it is only the Seventh day Adventist Church, and it would be the fulfillment of the vision that was shown by God to the prophet in vol Volume 1, Testimonies for the Church, 578, saying, That night I dreamed that I was in Battle Creek looking out from the side glass at the door, and saw a company marching up to the house two and two. They looked stern and determined. I know them well and turned to open the parlor door to receive them, but thought I would look again. The scene was changed. The company now presented the appearance of a Catholic procession. One bore in his hand across another a reed, and as they approached, the one carrying a reed made a circle around the house saying three times, this house is proscribed. The goods must be confiscated. Uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, 578. So, it was already shown by God to the prophet that later on, the Seventh-day Adventist Church will become Catholic. The same with the Ephesus. Later on, it became Catholic. Now, let us go back again to our subject concerning the exceeding great horn. Historically, the, the sanctuary in the first period of the exceeding great horn, pagan Rome, had been trodden underfoot, which is the Jewish church. And in the second period of the exceeding great horn, which is the papal Rome, the sanctuary had been trodden underfoot, which is the Ephesus. But why is it that it cannot be applied on the first period of the exceeding great horn, which is pagan Rome, and in the period of the ecclesiastical Rome, which is the second period of the exceeding great horn. It's so because on the first period of the exceeding great horn, pagan Rome, that although the sanctuary had been trodden underfoot, which is the Jewish church, 
but the statement be rule over all the earth cannot be applied on the first period because in the same place by which the sanctuary had been trodden underfoot god also raised up a movement which is the apostolic church so it can't be applied be rule over all the earth and during the dark ages in the old world in spite of the fact that the exceeding great horn through uh, the papal supremacy uh, trodden underfoot the daily and the sanctuary but still god raised up a movement in the same place so the production in daniel chapter 8 cannot be applied on the first period of uh, exceeding great horn as well as um the second period because according to tract number 4 page 26 it says note that the truth and the place not the sanctuary itself were cast down that is both christ's truth and his place in the early sanctuary were set aside so that the knowledge as to his mediatorial work became obscured uh, tract number 4 page 26 so if you will study closely daniel 8 verse 11 and 12 no it is not the sanctuary alone that or not the daily and the sanctuary alone that had been trodden underfoot but the place itself so meaning that in the third period um the exceeding great horn the place by which that sanctuary had been located that had been trodden underfoot by the exceeding great horn god would no longer raise a divinely called movement within that place so the spiritual side on the subject um, the exceeding great horn is to let us know that the last and the final movement which God would raise up cannot and will not originate in the symbolical earth. Otherwise, that prophecy that the horn bears rule all over the earth, which is pointing to the symbolical earth, can never be fulfilled. But the Bible is positive. The horn bears rule over all the earth. Uh, the same with the statement in 2SR page 97 that, but the prophetic word of God is positive. The wound is healed. Meaning, the, the movement that had been raised by God to continually inflict the wounded head had been defeated by the devil. Because prophecy never fails to tell the truth. Track number 12, page 57. And it is called the sure word of prophecy. So, to repeat again, uh, brothers and uh, sisters, the, the, the mere fact that the message is directed to the symbolical earth, um, Revelation 8 verse 13, there is a divine warning because it is natural um, and also logical that if you think that the true movement is in the United States of America, then 100% it will lead you to reject the message that comes from the movement by which God deposited the, the, the present truth. Because there is, you, you will never expect any message to any other movement if you think that the movement you belong is God's true movement. And that is uh, the reality, uh, brothers and sisters. So, it is also perfectly corroborating to the subject of the second angel's message. Because the second angel's message is directly applied in the judgment that pertains to the living. Not only the second, but as well as the first in general conference special page 39 saying that the three angels message is directly applied to the judgment that pertains to the living now focusing first to the second angels message in 2 sr 245 the, the shepherds had made it so plain that there are two babylons the babylon before the flood and the babylon after the flood so uh, there are many I would like to read that reading in 2SR 267. It says, A great church light by the power of the Spirit shining through the types is the only medium that can remove the obstruction and clear the way to an understanding of this and many other mysteries that are considered incomprehensive and that baffle the human mind. So, through typological representation, it will serve as a great search light that will clear all the messages by which it seems it baffles human mind. And here in 2SR 245, it says, 
Thus, the second angel's message of Revelation 14 verse 8 was proclaimed immediately after the disappointment, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That is, the world in 1844 fell in the same manner as the one before the flood. The present world is called Babylon because the kingdom of Babylon is the immediate one after the flood. Thus, Babylon become the mother of the nations. 2 SR 245. So in that reading, plainly indicating that there are two Babylons in the type. The Babylon during the antediluvian world and the Babylon during the post-diluvian world. But the Babylon in the antediluvian world is pointing only to the church because there was no state at that time. Which exactly and perfectly corroborating to the proclamation of the second angel's message, the fall of Babylon, on its primary phase, which is directed only to the churches. And what is the uh, significance of such proclamation? Let us read again into SR page 97. It says, The second angel's message of Revelation 14 verse 8 had announced that Babylon, the churches prior to 1844, had fallen. That is to say that God would let no light shine upon his word through these fallen churches. So that is the significance that God would no longer let any light come from heaven to be channeled from that fallen churches. So in 2SR 288 it says, 2SR 288, Second, the churches were in existence prior to 1844, fell with the proclamation of the second angel's message in Revelation 14 verse 8, showing that God would no longer reveal himself through that channel. So that is the significance of the proclamation of the second angel's message to inform all his people that he will no longer use those denominations by which God used them during the Dark Ages. But when they uh, generally rejected the message proclaimed by William Miller, which is represented by the Philadelphian Church, God rejected them and God would no longer let any light to shine from that movement. But in the final and direct fulfillment of the prophecy is no longer to the churches but to the place itself in the United States of America because that is the direct fulfillment of Revelation 14 uh, verse 8. Now reading here in the Great Controversy page 390, the Great Controversy page uh, 390, it says, I would like to read saying, the change is a progressive one, and the perfect fulfillment of Revelation 14 verse 8 is yet future. But in the upper part it says, The second angel's message of Revelation 14 was first preached in the summer of 1844, and it then had a for more direct application to the churches of the United States, where the warning of the judgment had been most widely proclaimed and most generally rejected, and where the declension in the churches had been most rapid. So the direct application must be, to the churches in the United States of America. But the fact is, in the perfect fulfillment of the prophecy, it is a proclamation or announcement made by God that He will no longer uh, allow uh, any messages coming from heaven to be channeled in that place in the United States of America. And Corroborating to the statement in 2 TG 22, page 22, uh, 2 TG 22, page 22, God's Spirit having been silenced in the North Country must denote that the messages of God in the North Country were generally rejected, especially the one of the fourth chariot, which caused the Spirit of Truth to turn away and to bring truth no more through them, to be silent there. And that, therefore, there is not to be expected any truth through them. And we know that it is pointing to the modern Babylon because uh, North Country represents uh, modern Babylon, which is exactly and perfectly corroborating or closely connected to the subject trumpets. Revelation 11 verse 3 because that is pointing to Babylon. Now, uh, let, let us uh, read again track number 2 uh, on page um, 28. Uh, so I would like to read. Uh, Saith the Lord God, I will bring Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the north. Ezekiel 26 verse 7. Again, when the Jews were returning from Babylon to Jerusalem, God spoke through his prophets, Zechariah saying, Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north. Zechariah 2 verse 6. Thus identifying Babylon as the north country. So, it points out to the north 
country and we know that that is pointing to uh, modern Babylon or the Christianized Rome and here in the old symbolic code I would like to read two symbolic code number one page eight as the fulfillment of this prophecy is yet future we cannot now tell who will then be the head king of the north of this prophetic nation modern Babylon that is symbolized by the two horned beast two symbolic code one page eight who is the modern Babylon the two horned beast but it is closely connected to daniel 11 verse 45 the only verse in chapter 11 which is still unfulfilled and we know that this must be fulfilled uh, after this presidential election in the united states of america and that is the last presidential election in the united states of america and all the prophecies will be fulfilled in quick succession in in the final movements will be rapid ones Volume 9, page 11, TM, page 116. So, to repeat again, uh, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 8, the perfect fulfillment is in the judgment that pertains to the living, and it points out to the United States of America that God will, will no longer let any truth to originate in the United States of America. And that is pointing to uh, the present truth under the seventh seal or the present truth in the last generation of men that uh, in 11 symbolic code number 3 page 5 present truth comes only from God and that final outpouring of present truth as stated in answer error, number 1 page 90 since present truth comes only from God and God himself says that I will no longer let any truth to, to be channeled in the United States of America, then why expect any message in the United States of America? But the truth mentioned there is the daily and the sanctuary. Because the, the, the Jebus Rod says in 2SR page 139, I would like to read 2SR page 139, it says, The Bible is the revelation of creation and redemption in Christ, Creator and Redeemer. Therefore, the Sabbath and the sanctuary constitute the truth. See Hebrews chapter 9 verse 10 and Hebrews chapter 4 verse 4 to 10. Thus, these two doctrines are coupled together, cannot be separated, and bear the whole truth. Uh, 2SR page 139. Now, ponder deeply, uh, brothers and sisters, why is it that Jesus Christ is very specific that the, the daily and the sanctuary have been trodden underfoot? It says, Stand in the holy place, Matthew 24, verse 15. To let us know that the period of time by which the daily and the sanctuary have been trodden underfoot is the period of time by which Jesus Christ uh, or Christ's mediatorial work is in the holy place. And to repeat again, brothers and sisters, in, in the great controversy 421, saying that Christ's mediatorial work in the holy place, uh, it is 1,800 years or 18 centuries. And since Jesus Christ entered the most holy place in October 22, 1844, then it's easy. 1844 minus 1,800, therefore it must be in 44 AD. So in 44 AD, Christ's mediatorial work in the holy place, in the heavenly sanctuary, commenced. And in that period of time, the exceeding great horn had trodden underfoot the, the daily and the sanctuary. And that is the mystery of iniquity. But it's according to the great controversy, page 49. Apostle Paul declared that in, in the first century, in, in that early date, the, the, the exceeding great horn are already creeping into the church. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, from I think verse 3 to verse 7. But we already explained that in, in Desire of Ages, page 77, and also in track number 3, page 72, uh, 73 that the uh, also in track number three right that the uh, Levitical priesthood um, uh, brothers and sisters is that um, projecting Christ mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary and since in the Levitical priesthood according to Leviticus 23 verse 23 24 25 that before the high priest shall enter the most holy place there must be 10 days proclamation 
and it is called the Feast of Trumpets, to prepare themselves so that they would afflict their souls so that they will not be cut off when the high priest shall enter to the most holy place. And that is perfectly typifying the movements of William Miller as recorded in Revelation chapter 10. That according to White House recruiter page 19, uh, William Miller start proclaiming that message in 1833. So that is a message of repentance within 10 years before Jesus Christ entered to the most holy place. Now we already read in Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection 111 and 112 that when Jesus Christ entered to the most holy place, the seventh angel commenced to sound. Therefore, the power of, uh, uh, of the third angel's message is also projected by the sounding of the seventh angel. The, the Sherpa's rod declared clearly in 2SR page 139. Let us read again the statement. It says here, uh, 2SR page 139, But the sanctuary and the daily were held to the ground by the great horn up to 1844. At that time, or in October 22, 1844, at that time he lost control of them, and the power of the three angels' messages raised the truth from the ground or from underfoot and placed it in the church to us our page 139. So the, the shepherd's rod made it so plain that in, in October 22, 1844, the exceeding great horn lost control of them. Because through the power of the, the, the three angels' messages, raised the truth from the ground and placed it on the proper place in the church where it belongs. Now, brothers and sisters, we already uh, read the, the, the message of the third angel or the three angels' messages is directly applied in the judgment that pertains to the living rather than to the dead, according to John Conference Special, page 39. So it was already predicted beforehand that the, the daily and the sanctuary will be completely trodden underfoot in the period of time when Christ's mediatorial work is in the holy place. And that is the reason that Jesus Christ uh, stand in the, uh, plainly declared stand in the holy place in Matthew 24 verse 15. So the, the, the mediatorial work of Jesus Christ from 44 AD to 1844, that is pertaining to the temple. And, and that is why the, the, the Bible says that, uh, let us read again the statement here in verse 1 chapter 11 on Revelation. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. And the word measure, meaning investigate, but it can be easily understood that through the message of the shepherd's rod, we could be able to understand the entire proceedings of the temple, altar, and worshiper. And that is the perfect fulfillment of the, the prophecy. The, the, the same with the book of Revelation. The, the promise in 2 TG number 12, page 30, saying that the revelation is to be more fully understood during the judgment of the living. And in track number 15, uh, saying in page 13, both seers distinctly declare that the event which they saw was the judgment. The difference between the two scenes is that Daniel was led to look into the sanctuary while preparations were being made for the judgment to convene, whereas John was led to look into the sanctuary after the judgment had been set up. In fact, John not only saw the judgment in progress, but he saw the whole proceedings from start to finish. Track 15, page 13. So, the entire book of Revelation, if it will be completely unfolded in the judgment that pertains to the living, then it is concerning the entire proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary from start to finish. And since only the temple, the altar, and the worshippers that had been commanded by God to the messenger to measure or to have a complete understanding concerning the proceedings of the temple, the altar, and the worshipper through the rod that had been given to him, so, through the Shepherd's Rod publications, those proceedings, the entire proceedings, will be completely unfolded. Now, in, in the period of Christ's mediatorial work from 44 AD to 1844, that is pertaining to the temple. And who are the temple? Those who died under the first five seals, as stated in Tract 
number track number 5 it is easier in track number 5 on page uh, 109 and 110 that's the temple the first and the largest object must represent the first and largest body of righteous dead those from Adam's time to the beginning of the judgment in 1844 so the temple are those who died under the first five seals but the altar the last seal that pertains to the dead the sixth seal So why is it that the 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 Jean Bosuan declared here in 2TG number uh, 12 uh, 2TG number 12 uh, saying page 30 where as the last two seals which contain the things that pertains to the judgment of the living to the people who must know that their cases are on trial the last two seals of course that is the sixth seal and the seventh seal So Christ's mediatorial work in the holy place is divided only into two sections. The first session is pertaining to the first five seals, the temple, and the second session in the holy place is the last two seals, the sixth seal and the worshiper or the altar and the uh, the worshiper. And that is the perfect fulfillment that in that period of time the exceeding great horn completely trodden underfoot the knowledge of the daily and the sanctuary or Christ's mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary where in the holy place not in the most holy place because during the period of time when Christ's mediatorial work is in the most holy place sister white and betty hotep both of them knew it that the mediatorial work of Jesus Christ in their lifetime is in the most holy place and that is the reality but in the period when Christ's mediatorial work is in the holy place in the last two seals nobody knows in the United States of America so the statement the power of the three angels messages raised the truth from the ground cannot be in the United States of America because they were in total darkness concerning Christ's mediatorial work in the holy place now going back again to testimonies for the church uh, volume uh, 2 page 190 um, the prophet declared clearly that the coming of Christ mentioned in that um, verse in Mark 13 in the parable of Mark 13 verse 34 to verse 37 uh, volume 2 page 190 it says i would like to go directly to the middle part what time is he referred to not to the revelation of christ in the clouds of heaven to find a people asleep no but to his return from his ministration in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary when he lays off his priestly attire and clothes himself with the garments of vengeance and when the mandate goes forth he that is unjust let him be unjust still and he which is filthy let him be filthy still and he that is righteous let him be righteous still and he that is holy let him be holy still volume 2 page 190 and 191 so the word return indicates that he left the place and it's easy to understand uh, brothers and sisters uh, let me show to you although uh, i have no time to explain everything because it takes time but um for me faith lighten every every load so from october 10 uh october 11 44 ed according to great controversy 421 Within 1,800 years, Christ's mediatorial work in the holy place, in the holy place, it is pertaining to the first five seals called the temple. And this is the first session in the holy place from October 22, 1844 to October 10, uh, 2011. Eleven Bible calendar, but in Gregorian it is May nineteen two thousand eleven. This is two thousand twelve, brother. May nineteen two thousand eleven Gregorian calendar. This is the proceedings in the most holy place pertaining to most holy place. Still the proceedings of the temple blotting out of sins. But from May nineteen or uh, May twenty rather May twenty two thousand eleven a Gregorian calendar. And in Bible calendar, October 11, 2012, Bible calendar, within this period of time, up to March 27, 2021, or October 10, 2022, typifying the midnight cry in the days of William Miller, 10 years, 1833 to 1843, 10 years. This is also 10 years, which is the particular object in view. Christ's mediatorial work is in the holy place. It is 
the last two seals, the sixth seal, which is the altar and the worshippers. So during this period of time, Christ's mediatorial work is in the holy place. And Jesus Christ, uh, on March 27, 2021, will return to the most holy place. So that is the occurrences in the heavenly sanctuary by which the exerting great horn uh, are trodden underfoot. So I, I would like to emphasize in the perfect fulfillment of the prophecy that the statement lost control of them. It is a warning message to all in the United States of America. You cannot withhold God's people in bondage forever um, because it is predicted beforehand that when Jesus Christ will enter to the most holy place, you will lose control of them and it will only bring damnation to your own selves. So the, the very message in uh, answer error number four, I would like to read again. So I'm connecting all subjects. So here in answer error number 4, page 22 and 23, concerning Isaiah 63, verse 3, the first part of the verse applies to the first advent of Christ and the last part to the time of the purification of the church. So the last part is to the time of the purification of the church. And what is the message? That whoever continues to hold his people in bondage and in ignorance of his truth, will he tread in his anger and trample them in his fury? and sprinkled their blood upon his garments, thereby staining all his raiment, and thus setting his people free. So you cannot withhold God's people in darkness forever. So the, the, the statement in 1SR 153, I would like to read. 1SR 153. The first verse and part of the second apply to Christ himself at the beginning of his ministry. So, it is very important to understand uh, this prophecy, brothers and sisters. This prophecy says it will repeat itself with the people of God. This would find its fulfillment in the time of harvest with the 144,000. Those who escaped the ruin of Isaiah 59 and Isaiah 63. What is the ruin in Isaiah 59? How could you be able to escape the ruin in Isaiah 59? The, the ruin in Isaiah 59 is found in verse 16. Now, let us read 1SR 150. Verse 16, first part. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. God was astonished. Moses and Aaron stood between the dead and the living. Number 16, verse 48. God used Elijah on Mount Carmel. First Kings chapter 18. In the crisis there brought to view, God finds no man. Ezekiel 22, verse 30. So he himself interposes. So what is the ruin in Isaiah 59? That is pointing to the great apostasy because Isaiah 59 verse 16 according to 1SR 219 and 220 that is great apostasy it says 1SR 219 and 220 to the prophet Isaiah this great apostasy fostered by blind spiritual guides was revealed which he describes in the following scriptures and he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. Isaiah 59, 16. And look, and there was none to help, and I wonder that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it healed me. Isaiah 63, verse 5. Michael, looking forward to this wholesale deception, says, Trust ye not in a friend, and put ye, can not, put ye not confidence in a guide. Micah 7, verse 5. So, in that reading in 1SR 219 and 220, the great apostasy, there are three prophetic verses, Isaiah 59, 16, Isaiah 63, 5, and Micah 7, verse 5. So, Isaiah 59, verse 16, it is a great apostasy according to the shepherd's Now, what is that great apostasy? In 1SR 150, connect Ezekiel 22, verse 30. And if you will read volume 1, 355, Sister White says that the uh, that verse in um, Isaiah is pointing to the United States of America. And, uh, let me read to you in um, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, 355. Uh, volume 1, page 355. It says here, I was pointed to Isaiah 58, Isaiah 59, and Jeremiah 14. Is a description of the present state of our nation. The people of this nation have forsaken and forgotten God. They have chosen other gods and followed their own corrupt ways until God has turned from them. The inhabitants of the earth have trampled upon the law of God and broken His everlasting covenant. Uh, volume 1, 300. 
55 and 256. So that is very plain. Then Isaiah 59 is directed to the United States of America. So verse 16 is the fulfillment of the prophecy when God no longer sent any inspired servant in the United States of America. There was no man, meaning no more inspired servant that had been raised by God in the United States of America. And that is the ruin. If you could escape that ruin, what ruin? I already explained, brothers and sisters. Unless your spiritual understanding will be open that there is no more message to originate in the United States of America, there is no more possibility of escape because you are in a wholesale deception in such great apostasy. And what is the ruin in Isaiah 63? That is the statement in verse 3. We already read answer number 4, 22 and 23. That whoever hold God's people in spiritual bondage, hindering the message. What message? The daily and the sanctuary. So, the statement here in uh, 1SR page 153, pointing to Isaiah 61, by which it says that it was primarily applied to the beginning of Christ's ministry. When does the ministry of Christ begins, brothers and sisters? After his baptism. But we know that during uh, the 40 days, Jesus Christ never preached because he was in the wilderness temptation. Now, I would like to uh, read again in track number 3 on page uh, 58. It says, The three and one half years from the beginning of Christ's ministry to his crucifixion being the sowing time. How many years uh, how many years the sowing time? Three and a half years. And it is called the beginning of Christ's ministry. But we know that Isaiah 61, it was preached by Jesus Christ in the synagogue of Nazareth after the 40 days wilderness temptation. So it could no longer exactly 1,260 days. But the shepherds had made it so plain that the, the sowing time is exactly 1,260 days. Then with such evidences, we can easily discern that the beginning of Christ's ministry or, or the ministry of Christ, which is the sowing time, is divided into two divisions. The sowing time, by which that is Christ himself sowed the good seed, the beginning of Christ's ministry, and the closing of Christ's ministry, which is also the sowing time. But in that period of time, he appoints a man to reign in his stead. And that is the time that Jesus Christ is establishing the spiritual kingdom. Now, let me read to you again the statement in track number 3. On page 54, it says, The seed sower, the seed, the field, the season of cultivation and growing, and the season of harvest must together be perfectly calculated to illustrate the spiritual kingdom. Otherwise, the representation can only lead into error instead of into truth. Now, let us first uh, follow, uh, implicitly obey the, the injunction here that we need to perfectly calculate first the sowing time. For what purpose? To illustrate the spiritual kingdom. So concerning the sowing time, it is to illustrate the spiritual kingdom. In that period of time, the spiritual kingdom, that is, Jesus Christ is looking who are they to become the subjects of his kingdom. Although it was projected beforehand that that is the 144,000 living saints. According to testimonies to ministers 422 saying, Who are the subjects of the kingdom? You can project that paragraph. TM 422. And that is the 144,000. So that monition is tribe with all your power that God has given us to be among that special company. But in Advent Review, it says to belong the 144,000, you must join the triumphant church. And what is the triumphant church? That is, those who continually march on with the truth, the progress of the truth, and it is even more particularly pertaining to the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary. So it says here in 1 TG 51 page 10, Here we see that the church militant is in reality, the church which is militant against advancing truth, and the church triumphant is the church which marches on with the progress of truth. And that is even more pertaining to the proceedings in the heavenly sanctuary. It says in 1 TG 51 page 5, If the church is not commensurably growing and expanding, then how can she be a living church? And how can she keep up with the signs of the times and with the progress in the sanctuary above? Now, let us focus first to the sowing time, by which the sowing time we need to perfectly calculate. That is the admonition given by the voice of inspiration. What is to perfectly calculate? 
since it was already declared by the shepherd's rod that the sowing time is exactly 1260 days so we need to perfectly calculate now the the sowing time now we know that uh, i could no longer remember the diagram the diagram from christ uh, baptism the 40 days october 27 ed so if we have that diagram thursday friday saturday one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven so here this is the baptism of christ friday october 16 but the wilderness temptation began on april uh, october 18 and we have november 27 uh, ed then sunday monday tuesday wednesday Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So here, this is the end part of the 40 days temptation ended on november 27 but not until uh, jesus christ entered to the synagogue in nazareth december 6 27 ed because the shepherd's rod commanded us to perfectly calculate the the sowing time so we have already from christ's baptism here uh, october 16 there are already three days 16 17 18 then here 40 days so then we have uh, 1, 2, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, or at least 9 or 8 days, or 9 days. So, in the primary application, let us now look at uh, the time and death.com. December 6, 27 ED Bible calendar. No, this, this is computation up to April 16, 31 AD. How many days? December 6, 27 ED. Bible calendar, 27 ED, up to April 16, 31 ED. So that is only 1,210 days. 1,210 days. So at least there are uh, how many days which is missing? To 1,260. 50 days. So there are 50 days that had not been. Uh, so that 50 days is the, there is a mystery of that 50 days and for sure that is found in uh, the closing period of Christ's ministry the sowing time by which Jesus Christ will establish the spiritual kingdom by which the focal point is the 144,000 living saints why is it that uh, we say that that is the focal point because in the vision of sister white in early writings page 38 uh, only the 144,000 by which specifically jesus christ says my father i have spilled my blood i've split i have spilled my my blood for them and we studied that that, that is acquires ownership right in um answerer number two on page 88 answerer number two page 88 saying bringing bringing into prophetic focus the same event jesus declared parabolically a certain nobleman went to a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return luke 19 verse 12 note that he receives the kingdom acquires ownership of it while he is away not when he returns so acquires ownership meaning he claimed them as his own my blood father my blood i spilled my blood for them early writings page 38 he, he claimed that name that had been left in the lamb's book of life on march 27 2021 jesus christ acquires ownership and that's what it means that he receives the kingdom what kingdom that he receives while in the heavenly sanctuary the subject the subject of uh, the kingdom and that is the 144,000 living saints because god is not the god of the dead he is the god of the living according to matthew 22 now let us um, try to look at now brothers and sisters the uh, uh, the 50 days 
missing fifty days. First, let us go to first three days. The first three days in this study, although we'll explain it later, is no longer days but rather years, and that is from um, October twenty, two thousand seventeen, which is in uh, let us time and date that come by which on Bible calendar that is April sixteen, April sixteen, uh, two thousand nineteen which is closely connected to our subject, the, the five symbolical months from Christ's crucifixion, but no longer the literal because the, the trumpet study is not literal but symbolical. In the application, in the primary application that is literal, literal crucifixion, but we are studying the symbolical crucifixion by which he, he was crucified according to Revelation 11. I would like to read 2TG number 15. 2TG number 15 on page 12, it says, Now that the city is spiritually called Egypt, it denotes that it is holding God's people in slavery. So, the name Sodom denotes that God's true people will have to be rescued from it as was Lot. So, this spiritual Egypt, according to Revelation 11, that is the place by which Jesus Christ was crucified. And we know that that is symbolical. We need to study closely who are they the spiritual Egypt at this present time. But that is the place by which Jesus Christ was crucified. And that was fulfilled in uh, uh, April 16. Let us go to April 16, 2019 in Gregorian. That is October 20, 2017. Then let us add three years or... 1,080 days, uh, 1080, I think, or three years, then you will fall on April 16, 2022. And that is the very day by which the first of the first fruits is offered on the second day of the feast, um, April 16, 2022, or October 4, 2020. So we will be lo looking now the remaining 47 days because we have already the three which is symbolical, represent three, three years. And also the 40 days is symbolical, as well as the seven days. So, I would like to um, continue this subject on our next episode. And uh, we hope and pray that our brethren will continually abide listening and viewing this program. Um, because at, at this time, in reality, I am not uh, feeling well. And... Uh, hoping that we could be able to continue this subject on our our next episode. So thank you very much for listening and uh, viewing this program. May the good Lord bless you and have a beautiful, wonderful evening.